Welcome to Sunday Worship at FBC Clever. We are so glad you were able to join us online today. If you would like to connect with us or learn more about FBC Clever, please visit fbcclever.org and scroll down to the bottom of the page to fill out an online connect card. Again, we are so glad you were able to join us and we hope that you are blessed and encouraged by our services today. Well, good morning, church. Let's come on in. Let's stand together. We're going to sing and worship. Hope you're excited to be in church this morning. We're going to sing. Here we go. Come on, let's worship together. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the red sea. My God, He holds a victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house for the Lord. There's joy in the house for the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout. Shout out your grace, let's join us 
awesome. Well, you can have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we recognize obviously here uh, that Memorial Day weekend is not just a extended weekend for relaxation, but it's a weekend to remember those who have given their lives and uh, so that we can gather here and do what we're doing this morning to worship Jesus in total freedom and to do so without any fear uh, of any outside force. And so we're grateful for that. And we know the Bible says this, there's no greater love than a man to lay down his life for another. And so those who did that are really just emblematic of Jesus Christ who did that ultimately for us by laying down his life so that we could have eternal forgiveness of sins and eternal freedom. And so we're grateful for that. And we're celebrating the reality of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection this morning with a baptism. So we have Shaylin. She's coming this morning. Amen. Amen. Shaylin, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Amen. Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Well, amen. Let's go ahead and join our hearts together in a word of prayer. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your goodness and grace and mercy in our lives. We thank you that we can gather here this morning in this place with these people who are so very special to us, Lord, to worship you and to exalt you. Father, we thank you for you still saving souls. We thank you that Shaylin is trusted in you as her Lord and Savior. And we thank you that this morning she took the step of obedience to follow you in believers' baptism. And God, we pray especially for her that you would keep her very close to you. You've given her great gifts and talents. Lord, I pray that she'd use those to further your kingdom. We pray this in the sweet name of Jesus and all God's people said... Amen. Would you take a moment, greet one another, and smooch your spouse?
us this morning. open our ears open to hear and our hearts uh, open to receive um, what you have for us this morning it's in jesus name we pray amen you can have a seat for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry abba father for i am not ashamed of the gospel 
for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Well, amen. Thank you, praise team. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Romans and make your way to Romans Chapter 8, verse 28. We are in our 19th week of our line-by-line study through the book of Romans that we've entitled Unashamed. Now, Paul's book here, Romans, is his magnum opus. It's his masterpiece. We've noted how it's very doctrinally dense. We know that it can at times be challenging and confusing to comprehend, but it becomes easier when we view it in light of the fact that at its core, the book of Romans is all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's that good news that a sinful man can be brought into right relationship with a holy God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that Paul is so unashamedly and enthusiastically proclaiming throughout this book. But we've noted that before he can get too far into the good news, he's got to deal with the bad news that precedes the good news. Before we get into the fact that we can be saved, we have to deal with the reality that each and every one of us must be saved. Saved. Romans 3.23 declares, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And no matter where you are on sin spectrum, whether you've sinned a little or sinned a lot, the issue is you sinned. And your sin separates you from a holy God. But then as we close out the end of chapter 3, we noted that Paul made a magnificent shift from the bad news to the good news. He shifted, although we'd all sinned and we all deserve judgment, he shifts to the good news that we can all be delivered. There's salvation to be had in the finished work of Jesus and it cost us nothing. The Bible says that through faith, just believing in the finished work of Jesus, we can be saved. And so he declares that good news to us. And then we make it to chapter six and Paul explains that once a person is trusted in Jesus Christ, They're not only immediately justified, declared as if they've never sinned, but we begin this process whereby we progressively become sanctified. That means that we are not only declared righteous, but over time we begin to display that righteousness outside in our lives. And he tells us the reason that happens is because when a person receives Jesus, a couple things happen. Number one, we get new life in Jesus Christ. He lives in us and through us, and with that new life comes a new life. Lord Jesus takes over us. And so salvation changes our very essence and it changes our allegiance. And these two realities progressively move us towards sanctification whereby we become more and more like Jesus. And then we made it to chapter seven. And if chapter seven wasn't in the Bible, we'd all think we were broken. Because in chapter seven, Paul gets honest. And he says, even though I'm a saint of God who's been forgiven of my sins, I'm still capable of sinning. He said, I've discovered there are two laws present in my members. I now have the law of the Spirit of God inside me as a Christian, but I also still contend with the law of the flesh that's unredeemed. And he says, the two war against one another. And he said, I've discovered that when I feed the flesh, it is agony to my soul. But when I walk in faith by submitting to the Spirit, it is victory. And that brings us to where we are this morning, chapter 8 the glorious chapter of the book of Romans. The tone of chapter eight is so much different than chapter seven. Chapter seven was filled with despair. Chapter eight, adoration and celebration. Chapter eight opens with that assurance that we have no condemnation now that we're Christians. It closes with the promise that we will have no separation between us and God as Christians. In between, we've talked about our spiritual adoption and today we'll examine the incredible promise given to us by a providential God. The promise is there in Romans 8, 28. Now, we're only going to look at one verse this morning. This is one of the most powerful and popular verses in all the Bible. Just 25 total words in English and only 13 in Greek. Yet it is so packed full of truth that I'm going to give you a five-point sermon this morning out of one verse of the Bible, Romans 8, 28. So with that as sort of the introduction, if you're able and you found your place, would you stand to your feet? just simply as a way of showing honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. If you're there in Romans 8, 28, give a hearty amen. Amen. Let's read God's word together. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
to his purpose. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, to be surrounded by people that are special to us in a place that's special to us. Lord, to worship you. Lord, not only to sing songs to you, which we've done and we're so grateful for, but now, God, to open our, your word, turn our attention towards it. And God, I pray that you would supernaturally open our hearts to receive your truth not just by way of instruction, but by way of transformation. God, I pray that you'd encourage the heart of the believer greatly by the promise found here in your word. I pray, God, that through the preaching and teaching of your word, coupled with the ministry of your spirit, you might bring someone in this place that doesn't yet have a personal relationship with you to a a point where they recognize their sin is the problem, but then that they would also understand that there is your Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the solution And I pray this morning that they would repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name and all God's people said, and you may be seated. Now, I know that all of you are on pins and needles for July, for in July, you know, the annual Jigsaw Puzzle International Convention will be held in Las Vegas, Nevada. I know many of you already have your tickets. It is the world's largest gathering of dissectionologists. Dissectionologists are what we call jigsaw enthusiasts. That's the technical term for it. And so they will all gather there, and they will gather there for different reasons. One is to purchase rare and interesting and challenging puzzles from all the many vendors who are present. They will get to hear speeches from Guinness, or Guinness World Book of Record holders and puzzle put togetherism, whatever you call that. They'll hear from other puzzle masters. And they themselves will even compete in various in-person jigsaw puzzle competition, completion. Uh, There'll be prizes. There'll be all sorts of stuff. But they're also there to cast their vote to determine which puzzles are the most interesting, innovative, and infuriating that have been produced that year or in previous years. Well, there's one puzzle that has been voted the world's most difficult 2D puzzle in the world three different times. It's designed by a Japanese manufacturer. It's called the Beverly Micro Black Hell Jigsaw Puzzle. And here it is, right? I ordered it on Amazon. It was 17 bucks. The puzzle is difficult, not because of it's so many pieces. It has 1,000, but that's nowhere near the largest puzzle of 551,000 pieces. No, this puzzle is difficult because it consists of just one single color, matte black. It is solid matte black. And to add an extra layer of frustration, the 1,000 pieces are micro-sized. When you finish it, this is to scale, this little box here. 1,000 pieces, matte black, will fit into that bad boy right there. Now, one man described this puzzle as the devil reincarnate in in an inanimate object. He said there's no pattern, there's no structure, there's no way to have any clue how these pieces might fit together. You can't find the edge. There's no way of knowing. And so it's the most frustrating puzzle I've ever tried. I am seven months in and only two thirds of the way complete. I can't work for more than five minutes without wanting to pull my hair out. So why is it so frustrating? Well, when you are clueless about how the pieces of a puzzle are going to fit together, frustration abounds. And the same is true in life. There are few things that can be more frustrating than when we're looking at life and we can't seem to understand how all the pieces of our lives are going to fit together. How when we look around and we see that all the things aren't coming together as we'd hoped and how we so delicately planned out. Well, Paul here says that we have a divine dissectionologist. We have a divine lover of puzzles. And he gives us a profound promise for all that puzzles us in our lives. It is a promise that we can cling to when we face pain that doesn't make sense, tragedy and sickness and sorrow. It's a promise that we can rest in when nothing in our life seems to make sense. When all of life feels like it's happening to us haphazardly, when it all feels like it's random, when we don't understand why God would allow us to go through certain things we're going through, when we're filled with all sorts of confusion and frustration and even doubt and despair, God's got a promise for us. And it's here in Romans 8, 28, where he says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. This is a promise. It's a promise that R.A. Torrey called a soft pillow for a tired heart. He went on to say, and oh, how many times I've rested my soul on the promise contained 
in this verse. Hear me, I believe this, that this one verse constitutes the pinnacle promise to the Christian given to us by a providential God. And so what I want us to do this morning is just slow walk our way through this section. I want to fully probe phase by phase, phrase by phrase, and consider the five facets of God's promise that he gives to us as a providential God to his people. And so first and foremost this morning, I want to look at the certainty of God's promise contained here in Romans 8.28. Let's look at it together. Romans 8.28, he starts out saying this, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. There's a ring of definitiveness in Paul's language here. He's not scratching his head. He's not going, uh, well, maybe, I think so, I hope so. No, Paul says, and we know. Kenneth Weath, who's a Greek scholar who translated the New Testament, said that this verse, this little section, could be translated this way, and we know this with absolute truth and total awareness that God works all things together for good. And so what's very clear is Paul wants to make something very plain on the front end of this promise. And that is that we can be certain that God can work everything out every time. You know, there's a lot in this world that we don't know. Can I get an amen to that? And even the Bible affirms there's a lot we don't know. For example, in our immediate context down to verse 26 of Romans 8, Paul says, we don't even know sometimes how we ought to pray. Uh, In James 4, verse 14, it says, for we do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. None of us know for certain tomorrow what's going to happen when we wake or even if we will wake up because Isaac said this in Genesis 27, 7, for I don't even know the day of my own death and none of us do. Jesus said these words in Matthew 25, 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming when Jesus shall return. And so there's a lot of things, if we're honest, and even the Bible affirms, that we have no clue about. But that is why this promise here is so powerful. That even though there are endless uncertainties in our immediacy of our life, we can have total certainty that ultimately God is going to work it all out. He says, you may not know how, but I'm going to. You can be sure of that. You can stand on that. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together. There's a certainty to this. Now, listen, it's true that this verse would still be great even if it didn't say, and we know. If that were missing. If this verse just started out, all things work together for good and didn't include the phrase, and we know, it would still be a great verse. Donald Gray Barnhouse in his commentary on Romans said these words, It would be wonderful if all things worked together for our good without our knowing it, and we just found out about it later in heaven. That'd still be wonderful. But even better, the Bible says it is possible in the here and now to know, to have certainty, and to know that all things, even in our calamity, to have certainty that all things, in all things, God is working. Why is that so important? Because listen to me, Christian, there's a temptation to abandon what we know when we don't know things. And what this is, is a promise to never abandon what you do know that God has revealed in the light of his word when you're going through the darkness of your days and you don't know why what's happening is happening. So Paul starts on the beginning. Listen, you may not know the how, but you know the who, who knows how all things are going to work together for good. And so on the very front end of this promise, there is a certainty to this promise. You may not know how the pieces are going to fit together, but you know the who that has made a promise to you that he's going to fit them all together. And because of that, you can lay your head on this pillow of this promise with certainty, knowing that God cares for you. That's the first facet. And it's this certainty that allows you and I to walk with a quiet confidence in the midst of all the craziness and all the chaos and all the strangeness of the climate of this air, when we don't know, we still know who is working out all the how that we have no answers to. And so in this one verse, we start out by seeing the certainty of God's promise. Paul wants us to know that we can know. But not only the certainty, I want you to notice the comprehensiveness of God's promise, what all it includes. 
He says this, and we know that, what are the next two words? All things. And we know all things work together for good. The all things here is totally comprehensive. I had a Bible professor who would always say this. He would always say, the Bible word for all means all, and that's all all means always. And then he'd pause and look at it and say, all right, did you, did you get it down? All means all, and that's all all means always. All right. And he would say it over and over again. So hear me. This promise has no restrictions. It has no qualifications. It has no limitations. It has no confinement. The point that Paul is trying to make here is nothing is beyond, nothing is beyond the overruling, overriding scope of God's providential care in our lives. And the reason that's so important, the reason Paul added the all things is because we are all tempted to think our things don't fit in this promise. Because we tell ourselves, nobody else is going through what I'm going through. That may be true, but it doesn't matter if no one in history has ever gone through what you're going through. It still fits in all things. And so you're not so unique that this promise doesn't apply to you as well. All things, no qualifications, no limitations, no confinement. Paul is saying there's nothing beyond the overriding, overruling scope of God's providential care for you and I. I love how George Mueller put it. I've mentioned George Mueller to you before. He was a great Christian. He operated by great faith. He operated several orphanages. And he never once in his life ever asked a person for money to fund the orphanages that he operated in Britain. He just prayed and God miraculously every time came through in miraculous ways. Well, in his, uh, his, his journal on Romans 8.28, he wrote this next to it. He said, in a thousand trials, it is not 500 of them that work for the believer's good, but 999 of them with one beside that work together for the good of God's people. In other words, it was his way of saying all things. William R. Newell wrote this. This verse means the dark things, the bright things, the happy things, the sad things, the sweet things, the bitter things, the things involved in times of prosperity, the things involved in times of adversity. In short, I believe all things mean all things. And so all things are contained within this. But be careful when you read this verse because one of the things with these famous verses is we so internalize them that sometimes we can homogenize the words together and we can begin to think something that the verse never said. And so sometimes people, without reading it afresh and anew, believe this verse says that all things are good. Paul never said all things are good. That would be a ludicrous, absurd statement, especially in view of what we see all around us. I mean, just this past week, the shooting in the school in Texas, and the one before that that was racially motivated in New York. I mean, that's not good. Listen, Paul is not saying, and he's not making you try to think that sickness, suffering, suicide, cancer, persecution, or grief, or any such thing is good. That's not what he's saying. On the contrary, he's declaring those things are evil. Like, you don't have to make yourself think that hatred is somehow going to uh, is, is as good as love or that somehow death is as good as life or somehow grief is as good as joy. No, what Paul is saying here is not that all things are good. Not only that, Paul is not saying that God works to cause all things. God isn't behind all things. Can I get an amen to that? God is never, it's never God's work that causes rape. It's never God's work that causes murder. Abuse is never caused by God. Hear me very clearly. This verse is not saying that God is the author of evil. God never causes any evil. Never, ever, 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 not God. So listen, that's not what the verse is saying. God's not saying in this verse that all things are good. God's not saying that God causes all things. God is also not saying that God is working it out for good for those who love him to only experience good things. That's not what the verse says. And I mention that because I know that there are many who are part of the word of faith teaching community. I call them joy boys because they're always talking about joy. They don't know it and they're not men. They're boys that are teaching false truth. But anyways, they teach this, that if you have enough faith that somehow God won't let anything bad happen to you. That if you're a Christian, that God will always give you perfect health and perfect prosperity, and God will always heal you of any disease that you may encounter. That is not what this verse declares. 
And it would be ludicrous even given the context. I mean, Paul had just in the preceding verses declared the opposite. In verse 17, if you look at it, Paul had talked about how saints will suffer, will endure suffering. He talks in verse 23 about how God's children will groan in this life. And so Paul isn't saying that God causes all things. Paul isn't saying that all things are good. Paul's not saying that if you're a believer, God will only let you experience good things. What Paul is saying is what Paul is saying. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Again, by Paul mentioning all things here, what he's really trying to point out is this. Get this settled in your spirit. There is nothing that is beyond the overruling, overriding scope of God's providential care for his children. That means there is nothing that falls outside the scope of this providential promise he's given to you as a person of God. And so what do we see in this verse? First of all, we see the certainty of God's promise. We can know. We see the comprehensiveness of God's promise. We can know that all things... I want you to see, we see the cohesiveness of God's promise. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 28 again. And we know that all things work together for good. Work together. Two words in English, just one word in Greek, and it's the word sun ergeo, sun ergero. And it means to use energy to yield. It's where we get our word synergy or synergism from. Now, if you know what synergy or synergism means, synergy is just the Uh, interacting and cooperation of two or more things. It's the working together of various elements to produce a result greater or different than the sum of the two parts. So if I take two things together and and I bring them together, I bring synergy, those two individual parts will make something else altogether new and something better that is greater than the two individual parts. And so that's what God does. He works together all these things. He soon geos them and he brings about something else. A few weeks ago, uh, I was uh, going through the kitchen and on our island, I'd noticed that Jade had just recently pulled out of the air fryer uh, some french fries. Now, I still can't taste many things. But there's one thing that I can taste, and these french fries are the perfect palate to lay hold of, the perfect base for what I can taste. And so before eating these french fries, I smothered them in crystallized poison, and I ate them, and they were delicious. Now, we don't call it poison. We call it table salt. But did you know, many of you do, that table salt is composed of two poisons, sodium and and chloride, and separately, those things are lethal if consumed. But when you take those two lethal poisons and you put them together, they become salt. And salt is glorious on fries. You must have salt on fries. So listen to me. Two dangerous things can be worked together. They can be soon ergeoed, synergized, and then transformed into one delicious thing. So what is lethal can be transformed to be something that is now beneficial, from lethal to beneficial. That's what's being said here in Romans 8.28. He's not saying those two things separately aren't poison. They are. But in the hand of God, he can synergize them to make them into something beneficial. Romans 8.28, for we know that all things worked together. They soon ergeo together for good. Now, it's important here that we don't think that Romans 8.28 is saying that all things will work out on their own towards good. He doesn't say here, don't get the idea that all things somehow will just work themselves out on their own towards good, that somehow there's this cosmic force or there's this cosmic karma and that, hey, everything's just going to work out and everything's going to be okay, no matter how much you hear the song that tells you that. No, the idea is that behind this all thing is an all-knowing providential God who is the prime powerhouse who's working behind the scenes. He's the one that takes all these ingredients, all the ingredients that make up your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, and he works together all of these things towards an ultimate good. It speaks of an ongoing activity, of an orchestrated or redeeming aspect of a God who is behind the scenes at work. Listen to me, only God can take all things and somehow make great things from them. So we don't tip our head towards karma or the cosmos. We recognize the way all things synergize is there is a all-powerful God working in all things to bring about good things. 
Hear me, only God is powerful and wise enough to take the bad things, the hard things, the evil things, and even the neutral things and somehow work all those things out for good. How many of you have ever watched the Food Network before? If you've watched one show, you've watched them all. I stand by that, right? They all have a very common component. All these cooking shows, whether it's Iron Chef or one of the 10,000 baking contests, they all have one thing they do, and that is at some point in the midst of the contest, they will surprise the chefs or the bakers with a mystery ingredient that somehow they will have to incorporate into their dish or their meal. I looked up some examples that have been used in Iron Chef in the past, and some of the mystery ingredients include fennel head ferns. I don't even know what those are. Squid ink. They had to work that junk in there. And get this, gooseneck barnacles. Now, whoever thought to sell a gooseneck barnacle? What is that? Just a barnacle? Oh, they'll they'll eat that. That'll be good. We'll sell that. Lots of money. I don't know how. Who eats gooseneck barnacles? But anyways, they throw these ingredients on them. And what's amazing is these super skilled chefs take these inferior or strange ingredients and they work them together, somehow synergize them into a good meal, into something tasty and delightful and delicious. And their skillful hands, bad things are used to become good things. Now, on the other hand, I have the other magical power. You could give me a bunch of incredible ingredients and somehow I could work them together to produce something that's inedible. I can take the incredible and make it inedible. And they can take the inedible and work it to credible. It's all about whose hands they're in. And that's what's happening here. In the hands of God, he can take inedible And he can make it incredible. He can take those things which harm us and hurt us and are evil in their own. And bad things people do and mishaps and even our own failure and our own faults and our own sin that we volitionally do. And God can somehow take all of that and work it together for good. But listen, it is God in any other hands. Nothing like this would happen. But in his hands, it can happen. Listen to me. It takes God doing the work in order for this promise to work. And so God gets the praise. And so let's look at the verse. We see the certainty of God's promise. And we know. We see the comprehensiveness of God's promise. And we know that all things. We see the cohesiveness of God's plan. And we know that all things work together. And now we see the culmination of God's plan. Works together for good. Now notice what the verse does not say. It does not say that we know that God works all things together for our comfort. It's not always that way. Sometimes things we experience in life, even as God is working, are very uncomfortable, very unpleasant. It doesn't say that he works all things together for our ease or for our prosperity or even for our physical health. Notice also it doesn't say he works all things together as per our desired pre-descripted plans. Sometimes God just throws it in a different direction. But the verse does say this, and we know that all things work together for good. Hear me, God is always working towards our supreme good. But listen, God gets to define what is good. And his goodness is always in light of eternal glories. Not just temporary, but eternal things. The word good there in Greek means to be useful, to be honorable, to be beneficial. That's the promise. See, our promise is that our providential God will take all the pieces of our lives and he is working them together for good, an ultimate good that is beyond our vision, even temporarily of good. So hear me, even when life doesn't make sense, he didn't promise it always makes sense. Even when you don't see God working, listen to me, God is always working and he's working things out for good. That is his providential plan. I keep using that word providential. What does the word providential mean? Well, the word providence in English comes from two words, pro, which means to be ahead or advanced, like a pro athlete is ahead of all other athletes. They're more advanced than all other athletes. They're out front. And then the other word, vide or video, we get that from, means to see. And so God is out front and he can see in advance of things. We see here He sees all the way to the end. He is providential. And so because he is providential, he is making provision for us in the future, even when it doesn't make sense to us. In other words, he is working all things together. And all things are working together for good because we have in in all things, 
We have them in the hands of the one who knows all things. He's a providential God. So he knows the future and we know he cares for his children. So he's providentially making provision in the future. To illustrate this, a while back, I read an autobiography by Henry Ford, and we all know Henry Ford is the one who's credited with being the inventor of the modern automobile. And I was amazed in reading that book how hands-on and every minute detail Henry Ford was in the construction of his automobiles. And so very early on in the process, he realized he can't make his own transmission. He's going to have to outsource that because early on they weren't equipped to do that. And so he found a company that he wanted to make the transmission, and he flew to that company. And he was very hands-on and he said, listen, I want to use your transmissions, but it's going to be contingent upon one thing, that you package these and ship these transmissions precisely how I tell you to ship them. And he actually brought a board of a specific make and type and it was cut to a certain level and he said, when you ship my transmissions, you're going to put them down on this board made of this material, cut this way, and you're going to drill the holes in a certain spot to attach the transmission to this board, and then you're going to cover it in this tarping stuff and you're going to send it. And the transmission company thought Henry Ford was crazy. And they said, there's more efficient ways to ship it. We don't know why you're drilling the holes where you're drilling them. We don't know why you're using the material you're using, but it's a big contract. Whatever, crazy Henry Ford will do it the way you say. And so they shipped these transmissions to Ford. Turns out old Henry knew exactly what he was doing. He knew the beginning from the end. And so when the transmission arrived, the workers would undrill them, unscrew them, move the transmission to the side, then pick up the piece of wood that they were shipped on, walk it over to the frame and drop it in. It became the bed of the Ford. Ford was so smart, he had the transmission company pay for the beds of his trucks that he was putting out there into the world. He was providential. He saw ahead of time. Everyone thought he was crazy. Why are you screwing there? Why are you using this material? Why are you cutting it this certain way? I know what I'm doing because I know the beginning from the end. I'm the creator of it, and I know how it's all going to come together. And so sometimes in your life, when you're looking around saying, why is God drilling and boring a hole here? I don't want it here. Why is he cutting my life to this size? I don't want it. Why is he making it of this material? I don't want it that way. Understand this. God knows exactly what he's doing. It is providential. He's moving towards a culmination, and the culmination is always for our good, for our completeness, for our total construction. So listen, our providential God is always able to take all the pieces of our life and work them together for good, no matter what. No matter what our situation, our suffering, no matter what persecution or our own sinful failure, our pain, our lack of faith, in those things as well as all other things, our Heavenly Father will work to produce ultimate victory and blessing in our life. He is working to bring about the culmination, and the culmination is our good. Now, why is that important? Because Paul is not expressing, hear me, faith in the goodness of all things. Paul is expressing faith in the goodness of God who can take all things and work them together. God doesn't expect you to just to praise him for evil, but God does expect you not to look at faith in the good things, but to look at God who is a good God who can take all things and work them together for good. Randy Alcorn, who wrote the book Heaven, he said this of this passage of scripture, do you see the difference between saying each thing is by itself good versus all things work together for good. He said, think about it. The difference is tremendous. This verse does not tell me that I should say that it is good if my leg gets broken or that I am expected to say that it is good if my house burns down or I am robbed or I am beaten or that it is good that one of my children or a parent dies. But it does say that God will take and use all of these events and somehow weave them together And every other facet of the universe together in such a way and order my life in such a way that it will produce what he knows to be the very best good for me. It's like playing chess. God isn't controlling both sides of the board. But no matter who you sit down against him, he is the ultimate chess master. And he will work all of those moves against them for the ultimate good of his victory. And so God isn't necessarily controlling all the evils. Man is making choices, but in the midst of that choice is God and his sovereignty and his providence can overrule all of those choices and it ends in good. And so there's the certainty of God's promise. There's the comprehensiveness, all things of God's promise. The cohesiveness, all things are working together and the culmination, all things are working together for good. The end is always good with God. Here's the last thing. 
there's a caveat of God's promise. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Here's the caveat. To those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, this is a wonderful promise. But this promise is not to every person on this earth. This promise is exclusively reserved for the redeemed. The redeemed are those who love God. Listen, our secular society tries to find solace in all the craziness and happenstance of this world. And they say, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Or, hey, I'm sure it'll all turn out for the good in the end. Not if you're not a believer. Listen to me. If you don't know and love God, life is meaningless ultimately. Here today, gone tomorrow, and it's forever pain. Listen, if you're here, even the good that is present right now in your life, you say, man, I got good health. I got good fitness. I got a good job. I got a good family. I've got a good wife. I've got a good life. All of that will end up bad if you don't know God and you don't love him. You're not called according to your pur- his purpose. It'll end in eternal hell. All of that goodness that God has shown on you will end in badness. But listen, the inverse is true. If you love God, and you're called according to his purpose, that means he made you and he made you on purpose. And when he saved you, he saved you on purpose for a purpose. If you love God, that's a believer. Everything ends in good for the believer. This is the most reoccurring truth in all the scripture for the Christian. It's from pages in the beginning all the way to the pages at the end. There's biblical example after biblical example of the proof of Romans 8, this principle being proven true over and over again in all sorts of people's lives. I think of in the Old Testament, I think of Noah and all the tragedy he ate, all of it worked out for good. I look at Moses, his wandering in the wilderness, all the crazy, it all worked out for good. Esther, All the tragedy. She was in the perfect place. It worked out for good. Job, the end was good. Daniel, being pulled out of Israel into the land of Shinar to Babylon. It all worked out for good. The ultimate example from the Old Testament is Joseph. Remember his brother sold him into slavery. He's sent down. He he works for Potiphar. He works his way to the top. Makes a good thing out of bad. She makes accusation. Potiphar's wife, he goes to prison. He works his way up to the top. They forget about him after he interprets dreams. It goes back bad. All of a sudden, he gets put to the second in command over all of Egypt. He gathers all the resources to make provision for Egypt. God had given him a vision. And then what happened? Those stinking brothers who had thrown him into slavery are starving. They make their way back over to Egypt to get some food. And Joseph says, hey, you remember that brother you threw into slavery? Yeah, how would you know about that? Because I'm him. And they thought, oh boy. We're about to die. Genesis 50 verse 20 is the Old Testament rendering of 828. It says this, Joseph said, but as for you, to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about that on this day, I could save many people alive. You did all this evil, but God worked it together. He synergized it in such a way that it brought about ultimate good. And I think of the New Testament, I think of one character primarily, and that is Paul. Listen, Paul was the greatest man on mission that we've ever known. He was a missionary. He planted church after church after church. He pastored those churches. He matured those churches. But then he got thrown into prison. Later, he got placed in house arrest. Why? For preaching Jesus. That's it. And now he's confined. He can no longer travel. He can no longer pastor. He can no longer plant churches. And you think, man, this is going to kill and crush Christianity. God's greatest missionary, confined. What a terrible thing. Well, what happens when he can't move? He takes out pen and paper and he starts writing these epistles. And I praise God for Paul's imprisonment. Because if it wasn't for Paul's imprisonment, I wouldn't know God the way I know him because half of the New Testament was written by Paul when he was in stinking prison. God worked all that bad together for good, and now we have God's word right in front of us. The very words we are reading would not be given to us if it hadn't been for some bad things happening in Paul's life that God worked about for good. And when I think of the final and best example of Romans 8, 28 and the pages of scripture, I think of the cross of Jesus Christ. What could be worse than the murder of God's son, the killing of the incarnate God, literally the worst day in human history, Jesus being falsely accused, put on a mock trial, being sentenced to death. He's, he's beaten, he's bleeding, he's stapled to the Roman instrument of execution. He's there dying on the cross. The very worst thing that could ever happen, humanity killing their creator. But yet out of the ashes of that, the greatest thing that ever happened was the cross of Jesus Christ. For without the cross of Jesus Christ, I could not know God. 
There would be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of God's blood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who eventually was beaten and murdered and put on a cross that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God can take all the bad and he works it together for good with one caveat for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know, many of us have heard the story of Jim Elliott. He's a missionary to the Aka Indians. They're down in uh, Ecuador. They're an unreached people group. He and four other men had been faithfully going into the jungles, sharing the gospel, putting it into the hearts of these individuals. And one day, this mission team, Jim and four others, went out to share the gospel, and they were attacked by those they were ministering to. They were killed. They were murdered by spears being thrown through their hearts by these evil men that they were trying to save. That was a pretty significant event because it happened in pretty modern history. And so it was worldwide news. And when news anchors and others talked about it, it was always talk of this seamless tragedy. Jim Elliott was an intelligent man, a promising young man. And they thought, what a waste of total human life, a, a terrible tragedy. But God took that tragedy, which was a genuine tragedy, and he worked it all together for good. You see, each one of those tribal people who had participated in the murder, they eventually all came to know Jesus Christ. Subsequent missionaries followed up the work of Jim Elliott. Over time, the gospel began to take root in these men's heart. They got saved and they took the gospel. The very man that put the spear in Jim Elliott's heart became the leader of these people. And he began sharing the gospel to where every one of them, even today, claimed to be Christian in that region in which Jim Elliott went into. They all became believers. So listen to me. Elizabeth Elliott just recently passed away, as have all the wives of those other missionaries. And so my mind is blown by this, that evil act of murder. But today, in light of eternity, it's all good because Jim Elliott is standing right next to the man who put a spear through his heart and murdered him. His wife, the other missionaries and their wives are all there around the throne of God, worshiping Jesus together. And if you were to ask them about their life, Elizabeth Elliott would say, losing my husband was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Jim would say, it was painful to be taken the way I was taken from this earth. And he would say, all of that was bad. But you know, looking back, our amazing good God could take all the bad and he could work it together for good. Why? Because we love God and we're called according to his purpose. Listen, our initial step of faith is to believe in God. The death, the burial, the resurrection, we believe in God. The way we advance in our faith is not just believing in God, it's believing God. He's given us a promise. You want to have mature, strong faith? Don't just believe in God. Believe God. That even when you don't know how, you know who has given you this promise. That he'll work all things together. The evil things, the painful things, the senseless things, together for good, for those who love God, are called according to his purpose. But listen, it's only for the believer. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, I plead with you this morning, repent of your sins. It means to turn from them towards Jesus. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Make that decision this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for this one verse of scripture. Thanks for tuning in for worship today. We're so glad that you were able to join us. If you want to connect with us or learn more about the ministry of FBC Clever, please visit fbcclever.org and scroll down to the bottom of the page to fill out an online connect card. This is a simple way for you to get in touch with our staff. If you'd like to join us in person, we have services at both 9 a.m. and 1030 a.m. here at FBC Clever on Sunday mornings. Again, thanks for joining us for worship today, and we hope to see you soon.